The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, Part 1, The Lord's Supper. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, also called the Passover, drew near. And Jesus said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man will be given over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and scribes assembled with the elders of the people in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted how they might take Jesus craftily and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, one of the twelve. He went his way to the chief priests and captains and spoke together with them how he, would, how he might betray Jesus to them. They were glad to hear him. He said to them, What will you give me to betray him to you? They promised to give him money and agreed with him for thirty pieces of silver. He accepted, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him in the absence of the multitude. Then came the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? He said to them, Go into the city, and when you have entered the city, watch for a man bearing a pitcher of water. When he meets you, follow him into the house where he enters. You shall say to the man who lives there, The master says to you, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house. Where is room for me to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them. They came into the city and found it as he had told them, and they made ready the Passover. When the hour was come, Jesus sat down and the apostles with him. As they were eating, he said, I have longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. As they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Truly I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of my Father. There was also a strife among them as to which of them would be accounted the greatest. He said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority over them are called benefactors. It shall not be so among you. He that is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that serves. For who is greater, he that sits at the table or he that serves? Is it not he that sits at the table? But I am among you as a servant. You are they who have continued with me in my temptations. I appoint you to a kingdom as my father has appointed me. You shall eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus knew that his hour was come to depart from the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Already Satan had put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. He rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and girded himself with a towel. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which, with which he was girded. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, do you wish, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not know now, but after these things you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. 
Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has been bathed does not need to wash more than his feet, for he is clean altogether. You are clean, but not all of you. He knew who was to betray him. That was why he said not everyone was clean. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me the Master and the Lord, and it is good that you say this, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have done this to show you the way to do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak of you all. I know whom I have chosen. The scripture must be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Already now I tell you of this before it happens, so that when it does happen you may believe that I am. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives anyone whom I shall send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, his spirit was in turmoil. He bore witness and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, that one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another dumbfounded about whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was leaning on Jesus' bosom. Simon Peter said to him, Ask who it is of whom he is speaking. That disciple who was reclining on Jesus' chest said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, It is the one to whom I shall give the piece of bread after I have dipped it. He dipped the piece of bread he had in his hand and gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After the piece of bread had been dipped, Satan entered into that one. Jesus said to him, What you are doing, do quickly. No one at the table knew what the purpose was of what Jesus had said to him. Because Judas kept the money bag, some thought Jesus had told him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. When that man had received the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and in, and in him God is glorified. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify him in, in himself, and at once he will glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. For this I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but afterwards you will follow me. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. The original song by Ed Bruce was popularized, of course, by Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson. It's a song that I certainly remember listening to growing up with my mom's many records, country records. But what's the reason, you ask? Make them be doctors and lawyers and such. Well, the same thing might be said of high priests in the Old Testament. Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be Israelite high priests. And why is that? Well, just think of the expense put into the vestments for Aaron 
the high priest, Moses' brother, the gold ephod, the onyx stones, the blue and scarlet yarns and very fine linens, a breastplate of gold with 12 different stones and much, much more. Neither Aaron nor anyone would have chosen to wear this ornate clothing on their own, by their own decision. But these were certainly God's specific instructions, very specific. There is certainly great beauty in these vestments, but why so ornate and expensive? Well, because these beautiful vestments all point forward. They were only a shadow of a priesthood that wasn't just temporary, but is eternal, an eternal priesthood. A high priest who will serve and who will intercede forever is to come. And even today, although not nearly as ornate and beautiful, but certainly very beautiful, your pastors still wear beautiful vestments. And other beauty can be seen all throughout the sanctuary, and certainly for a reason. Because the eternal high priest has come. He has come to us from heaven. The one who intercedes and who prays for each and every one of us daily, daily before the Father. And so beauty is still essential today, and we should spare no expense, because the focus isn't on us. It's on Jesus' beauty for us and in us. Not on your unworthy pastors, who wear these vestments, but on Christ, who clothes you also with beauty in your baptismal garments. And so behold the man, the beauty of a man who intercedes for you eternally, who prays for you unceasingly. Behold the God-man. God becomes man. He is the one forever priest who makes the once for all sacrifice, the eternal sacrifice for your sins. But you may ask, why do I need an intercessor? Why do I still need a a go-between today? If Jesus indeed made the final once for all sacrifice then why do I still need Jesus pleading my case before the Father? Well, have you looked in the mirror lately? Have you examined your heart lately? In all honesty, how is your prayer life? Have you been lazy or slothful? Have you been calling on the Lord as you should in your time of trouble? Have your thoughts gone completely undistracted in prayer? Or have you prayed for maybe just a couple seconds, maybe at most a minute, and then you're off to the next thing? Have you given up on fasting already? Pastor had a wonderful sermon last week on that. Have you kept the Sabbath holy? Have you been faithful in gladly hearing God's holy word preached into your ears? And have you responded faithfully to it? Have you used God's name only to call upon him and prayer, praise, and thanks, or have you used his name more often to curse, swear, lie, 
or deceive. When we look at ourselves in the mirror, when we examine our hearts, we recognize that none of us, none of us can intercede our case before God the Father daily, as we certainly do continue to sin in our daily lives. So behold the man who can and who does for each of us daily. We aren't holy on our own, even after baptism. But Jesus takes up our cause continually, that he has clothed us in his righteousness. So behold the man Jesus, God who has a voice to intercede for each of us. He has hands to, to fold in prayer like us, and his head bows down like ours, but in perfect concentration, in perfect reverence. None of us prays perfectly, and none of us prays without ceasing. But Jesus does. And to think this is what he is doing always. He is doing this for me, yes, for you, always. John chapter 17 is certainly one of the most beautiful prayers in all of Holy Scripture, Jesus' high priestly prayer. And so I encourage you in this Lenten season to, to meditate upon Jesus' prayer. This prayer is so beautifully filled with prayer in which Jesus focuses on praying for his disciples and also praying for you, for all who would come to believe, for his church, for all time, and that certainly is all believers in Christ Jesus. So dear friends in Christ, what then? What then of, of our life? And what then of our prayer life in Christ? Well, with Christ as your intercessor, you are encouraged to not be lazy, to not be slothful in your prayer life, or certainly in any part of your life for that matter. And St. Paul encourages us, along with the church in Rome, in Rome's, uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 11 to 13, with these words. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. The wisdom of Holy Scripture also tells us in the book of Proverbs what it means to be a productive citizen. One who is slothful in zeal is certainly not. He or she will never be successful as God sees success. Slothful describes the, the opposite of who we are to be in Christ Jesus, our high priest. God's word says, no lazy Christians. Proverbs teaches in multiple places that we can either be diligent in our lives or we can be slothful. Slothfulness will eventually lead us, though, into a deep, deep sleep. Idleness leads to hunger because one who is slothful fails to do one's duty and can't even earn an income. And the one who doesn't work, God says, doesn't eat. So God's word calls you, dear baptized children of God, to be diligent. Be diligent in your duties of life. Be diligent not only in prayer, but also 
in being productive with all of your time, in all areas of your callings. With Christ interceding, you have the energy to put into each day in service to him and in service to others. When sloth and laziness is repented of, it leads to joy, to joy in the Christian life, being fervent in the Spirit, serving the Lord in faithfulness and in gladness. With Jesus as our high priest, it gives us then a very new perspective in our Christian life. And it shows the greatest then of hospitality, of patience, constancy in prayer, and becoming a more generous giver. It shows us that as we are in Christ, who is our great high priest, that we are given strength. And we are given encouragement for the journey. In the name of Jesus, amen. We pray that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, would always keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our high priest. Amen.